and salutations today while the Washington DC political elite and corporate media talking heads mourn the loss of General Colin Powell the world is still reeling from one of the foreign policy legacies enacted during his time as George W Bush's Secretary of State I'm talking of course about the US war in Afghanistan started in response to the attacks on 9-11, the war against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda across the mountains and cities of the Central Asian nation eventually became the longest running war in U.S. history and racked up over $2.3 trillion in cost to U.S. taxpayers. But today, after U.S. President Joe Biden finally ended the U.S. military's reign in Afghanistan last summer, the future of Afghanistan is back in the Taliban's hands. But what does that future look like? How does a Taliban-run 21st century Afghanistan government operate? Will nations around the world recognize, not, not only recognize said Taliban government, but do business with them as well? Will the United States of America truly keep its militaristic hands to itself when it comes to the future of Afghanistan? And most importantly, can Afghanistan avoid the economic and humanitarian disaster many are predicting is right around the corner for that nation? And as the world ponders these very important questions, simmering underneath it all is the windfall of wealth. Greetings and salutations. Today, while the Washington, D.C. political elite and corporate media talking heads mourn the loss of General Colin Powell, the world is still reeling from one of the foreign policy legacies enacted during his time as George W. Bush's Secretary of State. I'm talking, of course, about the U.S. war in Afghanistan. Started in response to the attacks on 9-11, the war against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda across the mountains and cities of the Central Asian nation eventually became the longest-running war in U.S. history and racked up over $2.3 trillion in cost to U.S. taxpayers. But today, after U.S. President Joe Biden finally ended the U.S. military's reign in Afghanistan last summer, the future of Afghanistan is back in the Taliban's hands. But what does that future look like? How does a Taliban-run 21st century Afghanistan government operate? Will nations around the world recognize, not, not only recognize said Taliban government, but do business with them as well? Will the United States of America truly keep its militaristic hands to itself when it comes to the future of Afghanistan? And most importantly, can Afghanistan avoid the economic and humanitarian disaster many are predicting is right around the corner for that nation? And as the world ponders these very important questions, simmering underneath it all is the windfall of wealth hidden just below the surface of Afghanistan, quite literally. Foreign Policy reports that, quote, foreign powers have long eyed Afghanistan's mineral resources in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Imperial Britain and Germany performed large scale geological surveys of the country, and that recently the U.S. Defense Department released the findings of a 2010 study that concluded that Afghan deposits of copper, rare earths, lithium, and various minerals could be worth more than $1 trillion. Now, my friends, now do you see why the future of Afghanistan is important to so many of the world's superpowers? And that, my friends, is just the start of tonight's news on RT America. Hello, everyone. I am Tyrell Ventura, live from the RT America headquarters here in Washington, D.C. This is the news on RT America. Here is what's making headlines today. First up, the Pentagon is set to offer condolence payments to the relatives of the Afghanistan civilians killed last August in a U.S. drone strike. Definitely want to stay tuned for a full report and analysis of that. Meanwhile, 17 U.S. and Canadian Christian missionaries, including some minors, have been kidnapped on the island nation of Haiti. We'll bring you the latest. And finally, a new theory has surfaced in the massive California oil spill. It posits that the anchor from a 1,200-foot cargo ship may have actually been the culprit. We've got those details and a whole lot more as we start our show today. 
All right, we begin this evening with the aftermath of the deadly strike in the Afghan capital of Kabul that killed 10 innocent civilians, including seven kids. Now, the U.S. government is offering financial compensation to the families of those victims. This, as the situation in Afghanistan continues to deteriorate among civilians. And now Pakistan is closing its borders with a warning circulating the Taliban are coming. A lot to take in here now is Farron Franzak with her report. No one can compensate us. If you give us all the money in the world, it will not be enough. It's not possible. Amil Akbari lost his daughter, brother, and his brother's children on August 29th in a botched U.S. drone strike. U.S. forces were targeting ISIS-K members believed to be behind an attack at the Kabul airport days earlier. Make no mistake, uh, no military on the face of the earth works harder to avoid civilian casualties than the United States military. Since 2016, there have been more than 3,000 civilian deaths caused by U.S. drone strikes. Forty percent of those killed were children. I've been a long critic of U.S. use of drones and counterterrorism. Mary Ellen O'Connell is an international law professor and expert at the University of Notre Dame. While President Joe Biden says there are no longer troops in Afghanistan, the U.S. will continue counterterrorism operations he called, quote, over the horizon attacks. O'Connell says that means drone strikes, which violate international law. We've tried skirting around the law, finding loopholes, exceptions, stretching the law. And frankly, that is part of the reason why 20 years after the initial use of force against al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, we are still using military force. We want justice according to American law, and the person who pulled the trigger and those who gave the fire command should stand before a court of law. What justice looks like at the State Department? Financial compensation. The Pentagon saying condolence payments will be given to the surviving family members of the botched drone attack and work to bring surviving members to the United States. Condolence payments are not required, but it's been a method to keep the peace. Past payments have varied from $131 to $135,000. How much this family will receive is still being discussed. While many try to find a way to the United States, Afghanistan continues to sink into destitution since the Taliban takeover. Inflation has doubled, even tripled essentials. Some families in so much debt, parents are selling their children to pay it off. To fend off refugees, Pakistan has closed its borders. But emboldened by the return to power of the Taliban in Afghanistan, now Pakistan's own Taliban movement are gearing up to retake control of the borders they lost nearly seven years ago, warning the rest of Pakistan the Taliban are coming. For RT, I'm Farron Franzak. Joining us now to discuss the current state and future of Afghanistan and its people is the former cultural advisor and linguist for the U.S. Marine Corps and Army in the Halmam province of Afghanistan and the president of Afghan-American relations in office, Sabir Nasseri. Sabir, thank you so much for coming on and joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you for having me here. I would like to start uh, with the Pentagon's offer of condolence, condolence payments and, and to resettle the families of those 10 civilians who were killed by the Biden administration back in August. Does this offer by the U.S. go far enough, in your opinion, to make up for the brutality and tragedy that has been inflicted on those families? Uh, you're right. Um, uh, actually, the Pentagon mentioned the State Department as well. Majority of people, they still left behind over there in, uh, in Afghanistan, around Mazar Sharif area, and also airports. Uh, a lot of families that they are hiding from Taliban, they are selling their kids uh, to um, have food and uh, feed other families because there is uh, there is very hard to get the money from Western Union or from banks. There is no bank, no money, no government, no policy, no rule. Taliban, they're hiding. And Taliban, they're uh, hiding the, um, uh, the social medias. They're not letting the social media to broadcast. They're killing a lot of uh, innocent people door by door, door to door. They're walking around, and they're taking the family. They're taking those people who work for U.S. government or Afghanistan government. They're taking them to the desert and kill them and put them uh, 
dust on it, mm -hmm. which is that's unbelievable, and um, that's all people they blame on Mr. Joe Biden. Mm. I want to ask you about this this Taliban. Does this does this kind of version that we see of the Taliban today? Do they have the wherewithal and political ability to maintain a functioning national government in Afghanistan, or will we see the country kind of revert back into a more separate tribal-based rule? And how will that affect the national power in the region? What are your thoughts on those? Actually, there is a. Uh, the Taliban, they are tribals and they are uneducated and they are, um, uh, they are beast. Uh, the people of Afghanistan, majority people of Afghanistan say they cannot run the government unless they can take and bring the hope and also uh, support of people. The Taliban, they don't have support of people right now. They only have uh, China support, uh, Pakistan support, uh, and that they are uh, taking power. And the Taliban, they, are, uh, they don't have that much power, that much, uh, I mean, uh, soldiers to take the power, uh, like police stations. Before, we had, like, 150 uh, soldiers in, in each police station in Kabul. Now they have nine or 10 Taliban. They cannot come that much, but a lot of spies, their own people, they are spying street by street, day by day. They are bringing messages for the mm. uh, for the Taliban. Even a lot of linguists, uh, they they lost their lives, but nobody knows. We know because a lot of family they reported to us um, that we lost our uh, our interpreter or our son, our daughter. Mm. Uh, they are disappeared. Nobody knows where they are. I think the the U.S. government need to support uh, Afghan people, innocent people, and need to uh, not recognize the um, the Taliban regime. Majority people of Afghanistan have demonstration day by day everywhere, all around in Kabul, even in in Taliban regime, and here in Washington D.C. That we don't want United States to recognize Taliban government. That's a lot. You know, it'd be interesting to see how that moves forward in, 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 in not recognizing it when they're there right now. I mentioned the massive, potentially trillion-dollar bounty of mineral wealth in Afghanistan, not to mention the massive opium fields that dot the countryside. Can the Taliban actually maintain control of those very valuable resources inside the country, given the state that you say they are in? They cannot. The Taliban cannot control those. I know North or Northern Lion, uh, they, the Taliban, they attack on Northern Lion, Panjshir province. They lost uh, thousand, thousand uh, tank and ammunition in Northern Lion. Mm. Uh, but the government of uh, Taliban, I mean the um, uh, fascist and terrorist government, we call terrorist government right now, uh, they cannot control the equipment of uh, United States. A lot of uh, equipment, they don't have yeah. operation, they don't have mechanics. They don't have a good um, so, flight attender. They don't huh. have uh, uh, d d good people to so maintain in, and take care of the uh, U.S. Uh, equipment. So, in, and, in, uh, your, uh, by in, your, the way, in your analysis, they're really not in that place. And I, I want to thank you so much for coming on and joining us tonight and offering your insights, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, sir.